Welcome, Welcome everybody, and um, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us here at Long Bird Cage Walk, and also online. I believe we've got about 85 people signed up for the live stream uh, this afternoon. So thank you all very much for fighting your way through the crowds. Those who are here in uh, in person, they're not for us, unfortunately, John. I know we've had that conversation. Um, they're here for the state opening of Parliament, and as you can see, our location is uh, pretty well uh, pretty well located for that. So if there is a bit of noise outside, that's what it'll be related to. And there are no fire drills today, so in the event that the fire alarm does go off, it's for real. So please follow me or a member of staff or make our way down the stairs, which I <coughs> you saw on the way up. The muster point is over at Cockpit Steps, which is uh, up towards Buckingham Palace. So in the event uh, of any emergency, please follow us and we'll direct you there. Um, so it gives me a huge pleasure and a great delight to uh, introduce you to our speaker today. Uh, John Englander. So uh, welcome John, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, I think it's down to me just to give you a very short introduction uh, to our esteemed guest. So John is an oceanographer, uh, consultant and leading expert on sea level rise. His broad marine science background coupled with explorations to Greenland and Antarctica allows him to see the big picture of sea level rise and its societal impacts. And certainly a few of my colleagues and I, when we went to the UN Oceans Conference two weeks ago in New York, uh, we're hearing a lot about this. So I, for one, uh, am hugely excited to hear what you've got to say. Because for over 30 years, he's been a leader in both private and non-profit sectors, serving as chief executive for noteworthy organisations such as the International Sea Keepers and the Cousteau Society. Today, as founder of Englander and Associates, John works with business, businesses, governmental agencies, communities to understand the financial risks of increased flooding due to the compounding effects of rising seas, extreme tides, unprecedented rainfall and storm surge, and is an advocate for intelligent adaptation. His best-selling book, uh, this is my only prop, uh, is High Tide on the Main Street, Rising Sea Level and the Coming Coastal Crisis, clearly explains the science the impending devastating economic effects and the opportunity to design for a more resilient future. And Politico listed this as one of the top 50 books to read. So I'm sure you can acquire a copy today, but if not, the Institute is going to work with John to make sure we get this uh, very important publication more widely uh, available uh, out there. So uh, please, John is available to uh, pick that up afterwards. Uh, finally, he is a research fellow of the Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz, a fellow of the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology, uh, and a fellow of the Explorers Club, where I was very lucky to uh, visit uh, a couple of weeks ago too you know, in New York, and a member of several, several professional societies. I think you also hold dual degrees in geology and economics from Dickinson College. Um, so our guest, uh, John, if you would like to take the floor, it's all yours, uh, John Aiken. It's great to come back here to IMRS. Uh, some of you were here when I gave uh, the Stanley Gray lecture in, I think it was April 2009, so many, many years ago at this point. First time I've been back. <coughs> and, uh, long overdue, perhaps. What I'm going to cover today is to talk about the basics of sea level rise, which are perhaps surprising, but um, and bring it up to speed in terms of what's happening now, and some very latest information, which is a bit alarming, frankly. Uh, talk about the scenarios, what can happen in the century, how we can adapt, look at roles and opportunities for the maritime industry, MRS, and, and its members. Uh, so we can do questions and answers. We'll have plenty of time for that. And then we'll talk about the International Sea Level Institute. Which is kind of my latest venture. It's a nonprofit we're starting, and uh, perhaps there's an opportunity to have some alliance with the uh, IMRS as well on that. Uh, to, to kind of just give you my uh, anecdotal <coughs> trajectory on this, it really did start here when I gave that Stanley Gray lecture. I was already keen on the subject of climate and sea level and so on. The rising seems to be mystified was the title. The first time I gave a talk on it. So it really is coming home here to, to, to where this all started. I began writing my book a year or two later, and it took me several years to kind of figure out the facts and, and the, the best way to explain this. And since then, I've done a, a real quite a round of uh, briefings and keynotes just to give you a little smattering. That the upper left is a Senator Angus King, or you're seeing on TV a bit these days. We watch the U.S. He's part of the inquiry going on in the U.S. But that's also the commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, Admiral Paul Zukov. And we went to the Greenland last summer on a fact-finding trip. And I also testified to Congress. And in the lower left is the eight Arctic nations, 
U.S., Canada, Russia, and the five Scandinavian nations. The Coast Guards all work together because of the convergence in the Arctic for search and rescue and all the other issues that are going on up there. And I briefed them at, um, at their request a couple months ago. And then just uh, kind of a fourth frame, I was with the leadership of General Electric, uh, GE, in uh, Antarctica about 10 weeks ago, and uh, sort of 20 senior executives from all over the world. So I, I, I really kind of span the, the kind of profiles and presentations, and, and every presentation I do, I try to make it relevant to the people, because each group has a bit of a different concern or understanding or knowledge base, and certainly that applies here. So what we're going to look at is sea level, and um, a, a few of these slides may even be reminiscent. I'm mean, from, from when I was here uh, nine years ago, but I think probably eighty percent of them are certainly new. The sea level has gone up and down in a pattern of sorts, and if you go back four hundred thousand years, which is the frame of reference to see some six, some natural cycles, and then see what's happening now. That sea level goes up and down about one hundred and twenty meters, which is four hundred feet, on a, on, with a, almost a regular period. And we'll, uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. If we just put it against the building for a reference point, if we are on the 30th floor of a beautiful <coughs> high rise building, 20,000 years ago, and I'm going to come back to detail, but just to give you the big picture, sea levels at the ground floor, 200 million years longer. We know that from geology, from, as, uh, as David and I, you know, who studied the, in uh, oceanography, the, you know, how the ice age has changed. Uh, in a pattern, but we didn't really see it that well until recently because of the changes happening now. And if all the ice melts again, which hasn't happened for 30 million years, sea level would rise another 65 meters. Pretty stunning, 17 floors. And we tend to think of green and climate as, I say, the, a bucket, and we put all the things in the same bucket at times for green or environmental or concerned about sustainability or renewables. And I think we need to, for this purpose, for those, for certainly for the expertise of a group like IRS and those watching this, to really break that down a little bit. We're going to talk today briefly about the energy-related issues that is a topic in shipping, about um, what kind of fuel to use and, and, and what the uh, carbon emissions are of shipping. It's certainly a big subject and, and justifiably so. Uh, and that same discussion about renewable energy and reducing carbon footprints and greenhouse gases is a widespread one. It's in the vehicles and uh, how we make our energy and all of that, right? So we'll touch on that briefly, but that's not our main focus. And then the second thing that's considered green is reducing materials, recycling, waste reduction. Again, very valid. We're not going to get into that at all today because it doesn't directly affect sea level. The ecological and animal related issues from uh, ocean acidification to impacts on turtle populations and and fisheries and algaes and jellyfish, important stuff, and even the plant issues of the phytoplankton, important stuff. We're not going to get into that today because it does not directly affect sea level rise, and I'll, I'll connect the dots for you in a minute. And uh, the fourth is the general effects of the warming, which is the changing weather patterns, heavier rainfall events, also droughts, also more wildfires, uh, hotter days. We're now 34 degrees, 93 degrees Fahrenheit today. You know, unheard of, I guess. I was in Geneva yesterday. They were all talking about the heat and uh, climate change. Um, it's not for us, is it? <laughs> and then uh, rising sea level. So we're going to focus on the first and the fifth, if you bear with me, okay? We're not going to deal with the other three, even though they're all important, all valid, and all relevant to climate change, but they really don't relate to sea level rise. And I think if we're going to tackle and understand this and begin to plan and adapt for sea level, we need to stay focused on at least that chain of thought for, for a moment. Rising sea level is unique because it's slow and accelerating. It's unprecedented. It hasn't happened in 120,000 years, but it's higher than today. It can now be slowed, but it can't be stopped any longer. And that's a sobering, maybe distressing, maybe even depressing thought. But I would say it's kind of like getting older. It's like that we may wish it wouldn't happen, but we do prepare for it, right? We take care of ourselves, prepare for our family, etc. There are things in life that we wish were different. Um, it's now irreversible for centuries. It's quite a sobering thought, and it is, and I'll prove that to you. But it amplifies other forms of flooding. I like to characterize their 
at least four different forms of flooding, rising sea levels, the kind of slow and unique one we're going to talk about, that there's storm or other weather effects, which can be waves, storm surge, um, rainfall and runoff are all part of weather, we think of that. Then there's what I term topographic forcing, where as water goes into a tight, a smaller body, a bay, as happened in New York Harbor during Hurricane Sandy, but have, could happen in any confined bay from Boston Harbor to the Pearl River Delta in China to uh, the Baltic Sea, actually. You, you get water forcing up, up into a narrower confine, or the Bay of Fundy would be an extreme example. So the shape of the topography elevates the, the height of the water temporarily. And it needs to be calculated. Extreme tides. We know that the, the full moon or the new moon, the tides are more extreme because of the pull of the planets. And some of you may know that the tides follow not only a daily cycle, which progresses the time of the day and follows the full moon cycle, but there's certain high tides of the year, sometimes called king tides in some places. And tides actually follow an 18.6 year cycle, which has been known for centuries. 511, that's, too hard. that's that nuanced about it, but the tides are totally predictable to the centimeter, or the millimeter in fact, by location. Tens of years in advance. And then there's subsidence. If the land goes down or reverse goes up, uplift, that affects sea level because the land is moving in relation to sea level. I'll talk more about that. And then in red arms, there is erosion. You can kind of throw in erosion and confuse it with some of the rise and other things. Bless you. These things all have different drivers, predictability, magnitude, permanence, and impact areas. And some people just call it flooding, which is fine. But if we want to prepare for and understand something, we need to be a little more nuanced. We need to use a better terminology than flooding. Uh, this is a street in Florida where I happen to live. I'm not, I don't live on this street, but a friend does actually. And you'll notice there's a truck in the foreground and there's boats in the background. That's a street and it floods regularly. And the town has a sign that puts up no wake zone so you don't drive your car too quickly and create a wake. Normally reserved for canals and road traffic. And some of the residents are getting annoyed that when the flood subsides after the full moon high tide, that they don't take the sign down quickly enough and it's hurting their property values and some of them are trying to sell their real estate. Yeah. Think about the bizarreness of this. That street didn't used to flood 30 years ago. Now it floods more and more often. And it's all of this is happening all over the world. Now we don't want to admit it. We want to ignore it. The planet's warming. This is a NASA depiction showing the best calculation looking at the meteorological record versus the measurements from satellites in the modern era are five years compared to the prior century, actually since the old meteorologic record, which goes back to 1880. The red is two degrees Celsius <coughs> in that five-year period compared to the prior century. The place we've had two degrees sustained warming is all in the high latitudes, the Arctic. The two white spots, which would indicate no warming over the century, are off of Greenland and Antarctica because the melting ice, the water is cooling those areas. But no place on that diagram is cooler than it was over the last century. It's not the blues. And the problem is that while for most people, once you get above the Arctic Circle, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, that's where sea level is starting in Greenland and the other glaciers. <coughs> There's a lot of references and also misunderstanding of what the IPCC says. I mean, you know what the IPCC references? It's the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The most recent report, the fifth version, came out in 2013. And it said we should plan on, sorry, this is the American version, 10 to 32 inches, but 92 centimeters would be the upper limit for sea level protection. But as I will show you in a few minutes, it essentially leaves out <coughs> methane and Antarctic glaciers because they can't quantify it. I'll, I'll prove that to you with our work. <clears throat> but just to put things in a full perspective, again, I don't, I don't have an agenda here, let me say this up front, except to help people understand sea level rise so we can plan and adapt to it. That is my agenda. Sell a few books for applying that. Get some speaking fees where you start this institute. But I, I don't have products other than a book. If you will, I'm not, I'm not on a salary for anybody. I support myself. It's transparent. No corporations funding my work. 
we're looking for corporate funding and also institutional partners for the institute. But um, I think you'll see that this is really about, let's understand something that's pretty uh, ominous, but it is what it is, we've got to deal with it. If you look back at climate over the last, um, um, it, the top graph is 65 million years of temperature, average global temperature, as we get from the sea sediments. The, sea, the, the core is taken from ocean sediments without getting too technical. They will know what I mean. That um, if you plot the trajectory of average global temperature, which we can do with certain isotope proxies, we see that the planet was warming until about 50 million years ago, and then it's been a gradual cooling trend. And the second line down shows a little more detail of the last 5 million years. And the third line down is that curve again of the last four or five hundred thousand years of, sea, of temperature. And of course, sea level goes with temperature because the ice is the vehicle in between, right? Warmer temperature, less ice, higher sea level. So every chart of temperature over a long period of time is a chart of sea level. It's actually the kind of niggle with our difference. So one of the points of confusion is what about this Paris Climate Accord that, uh, that President Trump says the U.S. is going to back out of? Don't hold me guilty for that, please. <laughs> uh, but regardless of what the U.S. does, let's talk about the Paris Climate Accord from a year and a half ago. Because the best calculation, this is by a group, Climate Interactive, that is MIT, a very credible group, um, that I do a little work with and the highest respect for. In green there, they're showing the goals, and it's 3.6 Fahrenheit or 2.0 Celsius over pre-industrial. We've already had a degree Celsius, so I'll keep it Celsius here for the audience, of course. <clears throat> so they're saying the goal is to allow one more degree Celsius of warming. It's the goal, right? The calculation in yellow is if we don't do anything, we could have another three and a half degrees, so four and a half degrees over pre-industrial of temperature, global average temperature change. And with the proposals that are currently on the table, including the U.S.'s still participation, we would reduce the warming by a degree Celsius. Just. Now the hope is, once we get started on this and the countries all work together with or without the U.S., frankly, that we'll get better at it and we'll get it closer to the goal. Okay? But I want you to remember those numbers. Okay, we, we've already had a degree Celsius. We're going to come back for a second. The best case that anybody can project is to keep it to another degree, double the warming we already have. And that's a long shot from the proposals currently on the table. So, um, we think of climate change as a topic, but truthfully, I think we, we need to separate it into a couple of topics. The energy aspects, which is reducing the carbon emissions, the greenhouse gases, you can refer to that, right? certainly a big topic in shipping and in society at large and very valid. We need, that will slow the warming eventually. That's the tool to get to slower warming. We, am I pointing this in the right place or, there we go, okay. Um, we need to prepare for the broad effects of, of a warmer temperature, which is the increased temperatures themselves, changing weather patterns. More precipitation, which comes from as you heat the oceans, it's going to evaporate more. <coughs> There's more moisture in the air, so it's coming out as rain or snow, depending on the temperature. Even though there'd be more drought in certain places, but changing weather patterns, which has a really big impact on things like agriculture. We plan on when we can plant and high temperature rainfall, right? All over the world, it's a big impact on food supplies. There are more precipitations that I've just covered. There's increased fires from the warmer, drier world and ocean acidification. I'm not going to get into those issues today because they're covered, both the energy part and the part in orange, the effects, are covered by lots of organizations and lots of efforts and lots of education and good validity. What's not well understood is sea level rise. Sea level rise is essentially permanent. It can no longer be stopped, only to be slowed. It's going to move shorelines and it's going to increase the other effects of short-term flow. So it deserves to be looked at separately, because what happens otherwise is people say, oh yeah, see what, and what do we do about slowing the warming, or the greenhouse gases, or the energy, or the other, you know, what about this other effect? I say, well, that's fine, but let's just stay focused here for a minute on sea level, because it's going to change the coastlines, it's going to change the maps, it's going to change the ports. Right? 
So it's like anything. You talk about medicine, you can talk about your heart, your lungs, your your weight, your your diabetes. You, you keep a discussion about a subject to try and stay focused on understanding it and beginning to deal with it. The misunderstanding about sea level starts with something as simple as icebergs. Most people think that that's why sea levels rise. If I put an ice cube in a glass, I'll do this, and just draw a line, don't drink out of it, the level won't change, the ice melts. 10% above the surface, probably 10 or 15%, it's floating ice. Okay, so all of the icebergs and floating sea ice have no effect on sea level. They've already made their mark. To change the level of water in a glass, I can add an ice cube from outside. So an iceberg entry the ocean. Yet, as and we can be concerned about the polar bears with a certain charismatic animal and worth thinking about, but as the Arctic Ocean, the floating ice goes from white to dark. It's like taking a white roof house and painting it dark, dark blue or black. Heating can change, right? A little sore heat. It's one of the feedback loops that's happening in the Arctic. The other thing that's worth noting is that the Arctic has been frozen for three million years. It will be ice free in our lifetimes and for a few weeks in September and then for an increasing period of time. It has to be because the oceans have already been warmed in Europe. The ice is melting, and that's why the shipping routes are opening up, again, relevant to, to the shipping industry. But it's a profound thought that after millions of years of being frozen, the Arctic Ocean will be increasingly ice free, not year round ice free. The way that the Arctic has decreased in ice coverage is shown there in red. Oops. Um, um, the red line shows how the Arctic sea ice in, from satellite images and so on has decreased. The models for how it should decrease are all shown that kind of 13 noisy lines in the background. You don't need to pay attention to the details, but the point is that the actual decrease of Arctic sea ice has gone down much more precipitously than the models and projections, than all of them. And I'll talk to you about that in terms of sea level rise and events, because there's a good analogy. It's the ice on land, the glaciers, the glaciers, I should say. So, and they're getting darker from a couple of different causes. And as they melt and add it to the ocean height, or as they break off into icebergs, like adding another ice cube, they add to the ocean height, that's what affects sea level. The third effect on sea level besides the melt water, the icebergs or glaciers entering the sea, is that as the sea warms, it expands. Thermal expansion of seawater, it's been happening. In fact, there's been about eight or 10 centimeters this century, just from the expansion from that degree Celsius. You warm a substance it expands like the mercury of water. It's like the problem for sea level, to put it just front and center, and not get confused with anything else, is two places. 98% of potential sea level rise comes from Antarctic and Greenland. Seven meters from Greenland and 56 meters from Antarctic. All the other glaciers in the world, from Alaska to the Alps, to Kilimanjaro, etc., Peru. So it'll be pretty small stuff compared to the 64 meters in front of you. What do we know about sea level rise? We know that in the last century, it has risen about um, 18 to 20 centimeters. The rate of rise has recently, in the last few decades, doubled from an average for the, cent for the century of about 1.7 millimeters a year, and it's now about 3.4 millimeters a year. Really small stuff. That's an eighth of an inch. Okay, it's really dangerous to extrapolate that because the, the amounts are so small when you think about the global ocean height. But I can show you what's going to happen with doubling times. And the truth is that curve is already sweeping upward. <clears throat> now, for each vertical foot, centimeter, meter, it doesn't really matter. The, uh, the horizontal incursion of the land is much greater than you would think. It's about 300 to 1. And it's not its not what would happen here at this beach. That's got a much sharper slope. But behind that beach, there's an intercoastal waterway. And this happens to be Florida, but we could do this in Guatemala or anywhere else for that matter, I think, or certainly Bangladesh and so on. Often the beach has a steeper rise, the beach berm. 
for reasons of vegetation and sandbars and everything else that many of you may be aware of. It falls off again back in the inter intercoastal zone from the marshlands and so on and up tidal rivers. Okay. And that's as sea level rise is going to take land from all those places too. The effect of sea level, this is, a, I'm sorry, is a showing 13 US cities, but to just give you a comparison, and then I'll show you some international cities uh, in a moment. But that red line across the bottom is the 18 to 20 centimeters of sea level rise over the last century. Compared to cities from New Orleans to Galveston, uh, New York, and Los Angeles, during the same period of time, a little over a century, with the average being, um, Sorry, this is inches, eight to ten inches, uh, between forty-six inches to four. I think you can see the contrast just visually, right? And the difference is because land goes down or up, and that that either adds to sea level rise. So, if global sea level has risen twenty centimeters, but if the land has sunk a meter, when you measure sea level for that location, it's one point two meters, right? And if the land is uplifted, as is happening, and I'll show you in a second. Um, in some places, it subtracts from the current sea level rise. So in fact, here's the map that, I don't know if you can see it, but those arrows in the high latitudes are pointing downward. Sea level's dropping. You don't need to look at the detail. If you want to see this in detail or even download this, it's on my website, which I'll show you at the end how to get to it. And you can do free downloads and get more detail. But the point is that at the higher latitudes, sea level's dropping, where is its sea level's rising in the lower latitudes. And the reason is this is where the ice sheets and glaciers melted last. So we have what's called isostatic rebound. That the land is coming back up thousands of years after several kilometers of ice melted. Now, not fast, it's centimeters a year, but it's faster than sea levels rising at the moment. But it creates another point of misunderstanding. I gave a talk in Montreal a month ago to the Canadian Coast Guard and a bunch of the Arctic territories because they think they're seeing sea level rise. What they're seeing is huge erosion. They're actually having sea level falling. Again, how we frame things and in terms of how we understand them. Okay? But they're about to get whiplash because right now sea level is actually falling in the Arctic because the land is rising faster than sea level. But as what I'm about to show you in Greenland and Antarctic takes hold, and we get real sea level rise, like centimeters a year, what they thought was sea level rise is going to turn into you know, a gigantic change, and they're going to have a whole new problem. And now's the time to plan and, flood, uh, plan and adapt to that. We look at a big picture. Since the last ice age, sea level has risen to get 120 meters, 390 feet. It didn't do it smoothly. It got to the present level about 5,000 years ago. At those inflection points, they didn't use the term inflection points, but as, as we um, the history of sea level shows its own inflection points. And if you were any one of those three inflection points and you look to the past to figure out what's going to happen in the future, you'd be in for a big surprise. You're like trying to avoid a car crash by the neighbor in your room. Sometimes what's ahead of you doesn't isn't reflected by what's behind you. We know that. There's a change of a change of some you know basic factor, and that's what's happened before and is happening now. Um, it may be hard to see this, but these are some data points used in the city of Miami for 23 years of sea level changes that they've monitored. And there's arguments about where to predict that it's going. Well, on this chart, I mean, not the investment projection here, but you could do a straight line, you could do a curve, or you could plot up at least some square or whatever it is, okay? and you'd all get different directions for where is it headed, right? So my argument is let's look at the big picture. And in fact, the four counties of South Florida, where I happen to live, <coughs> um, have done a projection for what could happen. And they've looked out to the years 2030, 2060, and 2100, and looked at different ranges that they should plan for, the four counties from the Florida Keys up through Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and Palm Beach. And these are their numbers. And they say that you know, looking out over the next 13 years, in the year 2030, they should plan up to a foot, 30 centimeters of sea level. But going out to 2060, mid-century, up a foot or two, up to uh, 30 centimeters to a meter, roughly. And by the end of the century, anywhere from um, a meter to three meters, two and a half meters. 
Huge. Hard to imagine. Far more than the tidal swing. So, on my website, you can you can download this chart in metric or U.S. units, two different versions, and, and feel free to use this. It's it's becoming a widely used chart. It was developed for my book. Um, there's some black and white there. It's much nicer to see in color. This was done with Dr. James Hansen, a famous NASA scientist who was one of the early people to be concerned about climate change. Um, he helped me do this, and the same graph you've already seen about sea level, 400,000 years is the blue line. Global average temperature is the red. And in green is carbon dioxide in green. Easy to keep straight, right? And there's two or three things I point out to you in looking at this chart. First of all, the peaks all line up. They're also fairly evenly spaced. There was a natural cycle, right? The ice ages were every 100,000 years, actually between 95 and 125,000 years. We've had an ice age. Technically, we're still in an ice age, but what we call an ice age, the glacial maximum to geologists. And um, we're at the warm spot. And if it's warmer, the sea is higher, right? And we would have entered the normal 80,000 year period to the next ice age cold spot if we hadn't come along in the numbers where we are and with the technologies we have. Because the problem is that green line. The green and red lines go together by physics. Carbon dioxide and temperature will go together. Either one can lead the change. It's one of those interesting relationships in, his, in physics that, um, and I can, I, we don't have enough time today, but I'd be glad to explain it to you. The, uh, well, simply, if the ocean warms, it releases CO2, and CO2 is proven by John Tyndall in 1859, um, a Brit to, uh, to trap heat. Simple, simple demonstration, didn't require electricity even to, to prove that, very simple physics. And so they go together. And the problem is, of course, in the upper right-hand circle there, that CO2 has gone up like a rocket. It's broken out of the 180 and 200 to 280 parts per million range and is now at 400 parts per million. And, um, oh, the last significant point to make here is that the last time we were at the warm spot, even by nature, sea level got seven meters higher. We will go past that. It's, it's inconceivable that we wouldn't exceed that given where CO2 is and where temperature's headed. Now, if it takes four or five centuries, probably not a big problem. If it takes 40 or 50 years, big problem, obviously. So it all comes down to the rate. And to disappoint you up front, we don't know the rate, and we can't know the rate. I want to explain that to you. Because everybody thinks, well, just tell me when it will happen. That's like predicting a mudslide or an avalanche or an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, which you can maybe get a little bit of time in a volcanic eruption. But nobody can predict a mudslide a week in advance, right? Can you predict an avalanche? Well, maybe a little bit with some laser information now that you can say, watch out for that area if you're skiing, okay? But those kind of geotectonic shifts and collapses don't give us warning. And they're not, they don't model. We know we're going to have a San Francisco earthquake again. Nobody has any idea. They plan on a Category 8 within 50 years and a 10% chance. We're still building to it, okay? That's the best we can do. Same with sea level, because it comes down to when will, when will Antarctica and Greenland collapse? They don't model. <coughs> we do models, but we get fooled into thinking the model is reality. Not true. We get that data from ice cores by drilling down in Greenland. Uh, this is in a lab in uh, Denmark I just visited, and but there's about a dozen labs and dozens of projects around the world. We drill down into the ice from Greenland and Antarctica and get these ice cores, and in that person's fingers is a sample of about one year of snowfall. But what's most important is the little bright spots are air bubbles. And we can go into those air bubbles because they're encapsulated air samples, and we have 130,000 years of them from Greenland and 800,000 years of them from Antarctica, and they correlate, so it's good science. And different groups from different universities uh, competing with each other for better technologies come up with pretty roughly the same information. And we know from that the percentage of CO2, carbon dioxide, and we know temperature because there's two isotopes of oxygen, 16 and 18. And by molecular weight, they vary with temperature, the ratio. So we have a frozen air sample record going back 800,000 years in Antarctica that's corroborated by the 130,000 years in Greenland, and they're the same. So, which is what you'd expect that 
temperature patterns and CO2 would, would homogenize around the planet in the course of a year. Most people think that the melting ice around the North Pole is like the ice on Greenland and Antarctica. You probably know better, but that ice is opening up, of course. What surprises people is how big Greenland is. It's about the size of the eastern United States, 2,500 kilometers north-south and 1,500 kilometers east-west and covered by three kilometers of ice, enough to raise sea level seven or eight meters. Um, Sorry, we didn't remove this one slide. Let's see if I can go back there. This is an aerial view in Greenland of the output of Jakobshavn Glacier. It's the biggest glacier on Greenland. And you probably can't see this in detail, but just bear with me. This is a so an aerial satellite <coughs> view looking down. If you've been to Greenland, this is the town of Alulasat, where you've probably been. It's the probably the bigger tourist town. It's uh, several hundred kilometers north of Nuuk, the capital. But again, Greenland is just so big, it's hard to describe. For the, has anybody been to Greenland? Oh, okay, so trust me, okay. it, it is that big. Um, they are able to keep a record of where the glacier face was, the calving face, where the solid ice broke off into icebergs. And it goes back to 1851. So from 1851 to 1902, about a hand, right? From 1902 to 2002, a little bit longer, but not much, okay? A century compared to 50 years. And in the last 12 years, that far, no doubt that the glacier is melting quicker and receding quicker, right? And as the glacier face recedes, the icebergs come out and get into the shipping lanes. And by the way, this is where the, we believe the Titanic iceberg came from, Jakobshavn. Um, how are we doing on time? I, I, okay, I think there's a little video I'd like to show you if we can. Um, Katrina can do this. This is a four minute clip from a movie you can watch online, Chasing Ice. The problem for sea level is partly Greenland, which I'll take, I'll, that was an example of, but also Antarctica. And this is a colorized image of Antarctica. This is a peninsula where most people go to visit if they're going to see Antarctica, but it's melting the fastest because it's the northernmost and exposed to the sea. But the ice shelves you're hearing about, the Larsen Sea ice shelf is about to, big chunks about to break off. You may have seen that in the news, right? That, that there's concern that it'll happen very soon the big uh, fisher Ronnie ice shelf, the Ross ice shelf. Um, are, so the ice shelves are floating ice, and they don't affect sea level again. They're like an iceberg almost. They're mostly supported by the ocean water. So the break off of an ice shelf does not directly affect sea level, surprisingly. But what it does do is that as the ice shelf breaks away, it's holding back the glaciers on land. And they can then go into the ocean, which is adding to sea level. Okay, so a little sophisticated. The real problem in Antarctica is this area in red here. That's indicating temperature and movement. And um, I'm going to show you something at the end if it works, um, which just happened recently, which is probably the scariest thing I've seen in a while. But these glaciers here go underwater. And um, those six glaciers now from an aerial view, we call the Pine Island glaciers. The biggest one is the Thwaites, as shown there. Those six glaciers hold three and a half meters of sea level rise in them. We don't know when they're going to slide into the sea. It's not knowable. You, it, again, like an avalanche going up in the Alps and somebody saying, David, be careful skiing there because maybe there's going to be an avalanche. That's about all they could tell you, right? <laughs> they wouldn't say at 316 there's going to be an avalanche on Thursday. Not possible. Well, we have the same problem here because these glaciers, which go back 100 kilometers and are kilometers thick. Right now they're being held back by some bedrock, but they're being eaten away underneath to, to the distance of about 40 kilometers. And sometime by mid-century they're going to be able to get over the lip. And when they do, sea level will be many centimeters higher and at some point meters higher. Maybe it won't happen all until next century. The inability to say when is why the IPCC left it out of the top line projection. It was a footnote. I'm going to show you the silliness of that in a minute. Um, this is a big deal. This is going to change sea level in the world. This is going to change shorelines in the world. And it's different than the energy component. It's different than the other effects of climate change. 
it's different than the other uh, ocean issues of ocean acidification and changing bio biosystem. Um, again, Antarctica is, is oh, I, I may not have said it before, but so you've got the peninsula, you've got ice shelves, West Antarctic and East Antarctic, and they all behave differently. You don't need to become an uh, Antarctic expert, but they're changing weather patterns. And one reason that some climate doubters uh, either don't believe or try and confuse people is talk about the extra snow that's happening on East Antarctica. And that's true, but that's totally consistent with the climate model. That's not the problem. It's those glaciers that are in the warm area on West Antarctica that will slide into the sea. And now it's happening even on East Antarctica on certain places that are warming too. Um, if we can click this, and if not, again, I'll show you, I'll get you a link at the end. Is this going to work or not? Let's try this. This is a 13 second video that I just saw yesterday. That's one of the scarier things I've ever seen. It's a video from within the last year of Antarctica, 13 seconds long, but showing lots of water melting on the glaciers. We've never had melt water on the glaciers of Antarctica before. They also had <laughs> rain in Antarctica in the last year. It has never rained in Antarctica, ever, to our knowledge. The idea that it is raining and that there's pooling melt water in Antarctica is a really big deal, not in a good way. Because that's what started happening in Greenland about 10 or 20 years ago. I mean, glaciers are not supposed to have pooling water sitting on top of them, unless it's early signs of melting. We didn't think Antarctica was that progressed yet. There's no question we're going to have sea level rise. It's going to be greater than most people can imagine. But as I say, and I'm make it a little bit light, it's like getting older. You know, we have to plan for that too. And if we're going to be responsible for our kids and grandkids, just like planning for our own health and survival, we need to think about this realistically. Because, <coughs> in fact, most people were just ignorant that sea level could change at all. Because for 5,000 years it hadn't changed much. But it was the end of the 20,000 year up phase and beginning the 80,000 year down phase, following the Ice Age cycles. Right? We didn't see that. It was like slack tide. It was like going to the, to the inlet and showing up at lunchtime to have a sandwich and the water doesn't change height because you were there at ebb tide, right? Slack tide. And that's in effect what's happened. We were here at the, we, our civilization for the last 5,000 years flourished during the change of the up tide to the down tide. And we didn't think it would change much. Fair enough, right? But now it's gonna go higher and it's gotta exceed the place where it last made a high water mark of seven meters. So, what does it mean for IMRS, for the shipping industry, for people, just citizens of the planet? Sea level will continue to rise regardless of greenhouse gas reduction. We need to reduce the greenhouse gases to slow it, but we can no longer stop it. That's, as they say, an inconvenient or unfortunate truth. Ice melts in a warmer environment. And it's the ice on land, not the icebergs, that have the effect here. Whoops. Sorry, I should have, uh, I get back, yeah. The scientific projections tend to underestimate. I'll show you that in a moment. The two components you've got, it's glacier movement in Greenland and Antarctica. We are headed back to a point last seen 120,000 years ago when sea level was seven meters higher. Hopefully it will take a few centuries to get there if we do all the right things to slow the warming. But we need to start doing plan B and affects shipping, affects ports, affects shorelines, affects countries. I lived in the Bahamas for 25 years. A lot of that will disappear the same way the Maldives are being talked about. We should begin investing in planning for the future. The Dutch are setting an example, although even they don't have this uh, fully under control yet. Uh, there are various projections. I'm gonna speed up here because I because I treat this as a special audience. I've kind of gone a little bit long. Uh, and I don't want to only leave plenty of time for questions. There are various projections to this government report which said uh, there's a greater than 9 in 10 chance that sea level this century will be between 0.2 meters and 2 meters. And what's the problem with that statement? There's three problems with that statement. One is the range, right? How come that's the best you can do is 0.2 to 2 meters? Well, 
no, we do a little better than that, but actually it's, it's narrower and higher. But the second big problem is we have a greater than nine in 10 confidence that that's what the range will be. You'd never get on an airplane if they gave you nine in 10 chances to get to the destination, would you? <laughs> that's like Russian roulette almost, one in six. That it won't happen, that it'll be outside that envelope. Nobody reads it that way, even the experts. So well, we could have two meters, said, that's not the worst case. And in fact, this was written years ago. The latest report by the US government does say we could have up to two and a half meters by 2100. They've added a red line. And there'll be another line after that because as the melting happens faster, the projections will increase. Ironically, the scientists and various people do not want to be considered alarmist and they don't want to exaggerate and they don't want to open themselves up to saying we're taking the high end of the spectrum. And as a result, we tend not to do that. But here's a chart that should, I'll just decipher for you very quickly. There's five data points here, including now. It's sea level versus global average temperature. The other four data points are known out of the geologic record. From 20,000 years ago, it was 120 meters down. We've already covered that. From 120,000 years ago, when it was seven meters higher, we've covered that, right? Three million years ago, it was 20 meters higher. And 30, 40 million years ago, when there was no ice on the planet, we know that sea level was 60 or 70 meters higher, right? Now, the great thing is, that's a straight line. Those data points all correlate. Global sea level to temperature, with enough time for the ice sheets to adjust. The problem is, it's tw the slope is 20 meters per degree C. We've already had a degree warming. The question is, how quickly the ice sheets melt? We don't know. We're running the experiment now. You're all part of it. We're trying to see how quickly you can melt the ice sheets. <laughs> it's not a really smart experiment, but we're doing it. We need to try and slow the warming, no doubt. And that's some of the work of what your members are doing. And the shipping industry does have a role to play in that. But looking at it from the port standpoint and the shipping route standpoint, there's a whole nother angle to this that is often overlooked. Just some quick other visual ways. I mean, Florida today, we know what it looks like. 20,000 years ago, it was twice the size. 120,000 years ago, it was half the size, just because of a change in sea level, because it's a flat state. If we look at different places in the world, this is a meter showing in red what would disappear. Florida actually is uh, not that much comparatively. The Netherlands would be a lot if it gets over the dikes or the, the, the levees. But from uh, Brazil to Vietnam, bigger areas because flatter land. Latest U.S. government, not the latest, sorry, the, a year ago, the Department of Defense came out with a study that says we can no longer predict and then act, which is the basis of engineering and insurance. That let's study the past, look at the mechanics, come up with the numbers, the statistics, and that's how we predict insurance risk, and that's how we do design for engineering, right? Based upon what we can know, what we can show in the laboratory, what we can demonstrate. And it's been a good way to do it till now. But this Department of Defense study done with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, that's their logo, NOAA, and the oceanographer in the Navy said, you know what, if you really look at Greenland and Antarctica, we can't do that anymore. We can no longer predict and then act. We need to understand what could happen and run multiple extreme scenarios and not take the median, which is the temptation to take the midline. Because we don't take the medians and planning for storms or waves or anything else, we take the extremes, right? For good reason. And the good thing with sea level is, the truth is, there really is no other option on a warmer planet to have higher sea level. So there's a safety margin of planning for higher sea level. There is no alternate. I mean, it's gonna happen, it's only a matter of when. Oh, uh, let's see. The projections for sea level, I wanna end here to get, um, Plenty of time for questions, and I know you're all sobered or depressed or want to go to drink or something. You know? um, the projections for sea level going out by the IPCC were lower than the actual sea level shown there in gold with a trend, smoothed out trend line in red. The IPCC numbers are consistently low for sea level, even for the last 10 or 20 years, shown in green and blue there. Okay, and that's the same methodology that gets projection 92 centimeters. 
This is their table. I don't expect you to read it, but this is actually at page 1180 of the big thick book that the IPCC puts out. And they run four scenarios for sea level, or for climate, I should say. And this is the proof, if you will, of why this is a gross underestimate. They run, the scenarios technically are called 2.6 to 8.5. It's supposed to represent the amount of heating that the planet will experience compared to what the last few centuries. These are, I'm sorry, this is in inches. Um, but showing by the end of the century what the scenarios are for sea level and what it shows is what they've left out. I know that's not, that sounds like an opposite statement. But they're saying that from the lowest warming to the most warming, we're going to get two inches of land water storage contribution to the ocean. That's from pumping groundwater, removing a dam or something like that that takes water that used to be on land and putting it in the ocean somehow. Thermal expansion of seawater, I talked about as the oceans warm, they do get bigger. There's very little lag time of that. Glaciers and green kind of go from four inches to six, I guess. Greenland from uh, three, three, three and five, I guess it is, inches, excuse me again. And then Antarctica, two inch, two inch, two inch, and one inch. Every group of scientists I've shown said, say, come on. They said, that's not possible. In the warmest possible scenario, you'd have less contribution from Antarctica? It has to do with the methodology that they can't quantify it. But that, that East Antarctica, remember I mentioned that it's piling up more snow on certain parts of it? So technically, when they do the sums, it looks like it's reducing, but there's this big elephant in the room that they can't weigh. So what I like to point out is that you know if you take those same scales and just change the vertical scale and put in those six glaciers that I pointed out to you that we don't know when they're going to slide into the sea, you realize in effect that all of the arguments about what to do is chasing the mice. Because we can weigh the mice. They'll get on the scale. The elephant doesn't fit on the scale. I'm being facetious. It's a metaphor. <laughs> but you see the problem. And we don't know if this is all going to happen this century or not. We really don't. Maybe if we do all the right things to slow down the warming and greenhouse gases and the shipping industry gets goes to renewable energy somehow and cars are all salt, you know, electric, maybe we'll forestall that for a century or two. And that'd be great. But the thing is, we're building infrastructure today. <clears throat> not only docks and power plants and refineries and, and villages, and roads and railroads, power plants, based upon sea level, as if it's a static datum. It's the biggest reference point on Earth, isn't it? That plot is so far above sea level, or that diver went down below sea level, or the pilings, right? What happens when sea level moves? So, to conclude, um, we'll take questions, but it's going to continue for centuries. I mean, this may be a retired slide. Let's see what's happened here. I like to close with the, uh, many of you know this, you've probably even seen, the Maslan Kering, the big harbor gates at Rotterdam. Installed about 20 some years ago, now 25 years ago. It was the crowning jewel of the Dutch Delta Works plan. And as Brits, you may know this, no, no America would know this, but the storm in 1953, February 1st, which overnight destroyed a levee and killed 1,835 people, also came up the Thames and did a lot of damage here. Most of you aware of that? Um, they designed their whole Delta Works protection plan around that storm. And this was the crowning jewel of engineering. And they designed, here are the design parameters. Plan for a one in 10,000 year storm, like the worst that could ever happen. The worst river flooding from the Rhine, the Sheldon, the Meuse rivers that come down there from Europe and allow for 30 centimeters of sea level rise. A one in 10,000 year storm and 30 centimeters of sea level rise. You can see the disconnect. Because they're good engineers, back in the 1980s, that was the worst they could imagine. They didn't think you could melt the poles this quickly. So they've said to me, John, if we knew then what we know now, we would have built these two or three meters higher. And at $800 million, I think it was, whatever, a lot of money, um, they're very proud of their engineering. They wish they had designed this for higher. Just like the Thames Barrier, which also didn't quite expect the flooding that's happened since. So you have a close example. 
Um, every week I do a newsletter. You're welcome to, I, I don't advertise and I don't do anything with the names. If you want to get information like this and I dribble it out one article a week and then a survey from around the world. It's called Sea Level Rise Now. It's got its own little web address. I encourage you to easily remember Sea Level Rise Now or just johnenglander.net. Uh, you feel free to uh, do the social media stuff, which I'm still learning. Uh, so bear with me, Facebook and uh, Twitter and all that. I'll leave this up for a minute. This is various videos, including the two I showed here, number one and two. That's the 2016 13 second clip. That's the four minutes from Chasing Ice. And then some other bits and pieces, if you'd like to go and click on those links, either those watching from afar or those of you who go to see this on the IMRS website. And finally, um, <clears throat> You know, I guess two words about my institute. We're, we're starting this up. Again, uh, I haven't even had the chat with, with David yet about this, but um, we're looking for partner organizations to, to carry on this work and find broader outreach, institutional partners as well as private donors, and that's what we're working on now. And it's really to take this work, which started with my book you know, five, five years ago now, in effect, and uh, the talk here actually not eight, eight years ago uh, at IMRS, the Stanley Gray Lecture, and really help people understand, plan, and adapt for this for this new problem that few understand. I think that truly is the last slide. I said that before. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, rapt attention. Absolutely, no, please. So, so, but very well done. Only for a few hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how, how long have we got? We've got about 15 minutes. Is that right? And then I did. We did promise lunch, and lunch is on, and we're going to move outside. It's one o'clock now. We're actually not far behind schedule. Perfect. Yeah. So we've got 15 minutes for questions, and then we can carry on over a sandwich sure. outside. So shoot away, guys. Oh, oh, actually, can I just say when you when you ask your question, you say who you are. So John's got a few who you're speaking to. Thanks. I am Chris Floyd from Patrimon. Um, you mentioned this comment about um, scientists not wanting to be alarmist yes. with their predictions. Um, given that there seems to be at least a general agreement that it's going in this direction, um, how much do you think is really holding scientists back from being more alarmist or being more real about well, I think, I think this scenario? I, it's a great question. Um, we're changing, but scientists are used to proving things and peer-reviewed literature and so on. And what's happening is outside that cycle of timing, okay? It's happening too fast. Um, we're also into a situation now, again, when you just step back and look at this big picture, and I've done this to some very high-level people, Doug, trust me, both uh, national security and militaries and, and uh, even scientific groups. And it's a different look than they would normally do. Usually they get more granular, you know, about what did the ice core show. Okay, and I said, let's step back. Let's go across the room. I said, oh my God, you know, it's really, it's worse than I would have thought because it's the difference between detail and big picture. Um, the problem is, again, when you really get honest about it and you understand the geology or, the, or the, the glaciology, actually, that we can't predict exactly when the glaciers are going to collapse that way. But our instinct is to want to. People say, well, I'll design for it when you can tell me how high it'll be when. I say, tell me when I'm going to die, right? There's actual tables. I can, my dad's 99. God bless him. You know, I'll go see him next week, in fact. Okay. But I could get hit by a car walking out of the building, right? So we buy insurance policies. We prepare for things, right? Life has uncertainties. The problem is science and engineering and insurance, the risk industry, have all been predicated upon what they call stationary environment that the future will be like the recent past. It's different now. We've warmed the planet. We've broken out of this 5,000 year stability period. So I think scientists are trying to get around to it, but they've been trained in the engineering and, and insurance industries, all three of them, science, engineering, and, uh, and risk, have all been taught and developed and practiced proving the future based upon the past. You showed that, uh, that report earlier where the conclusion was there was a 9 in 10 chance of maybe something happening between here and here. Right. But, you know, we'll leave it at that. Right. 
It seems There's like there's a great report. I, I think it's on my web on my blog site again, JohnEnglander.net, or that other link I gave you a second ago. Um, that was done by um, the Geneva Association in, in Geneva, Switzerland. There's an, a think tank for the insurance industry, and they wrote a fabulous report. I'll be glad to send it to you, uh, David and Bev, to even share because it's just with four bullets in their executive summary. They they make this case. They say. You know, the warming of the oceans has profound impact for risk and truthfully for the world and quite unprecedented. And it is now irreversible, my same message. And it's hard to predict when. And the implications for the insurance industry are really big, okay? Because we've always thought with a big enough sample we could extrapolate the future, okay? So lots of professions from engineers, military, insurance, and marine engineering, your, your sector, you know, need to kind of step up into a new era. We see it all around us, temperatures, fires, etc. Yes. Are there any questions online that we should be dealing with before we... No? Okay. You don't have that. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Sam Hutchinson from Newton Europe. Um, I work in our maritime defense sector. Um, and we work a lot in the manufacturing side of it. But I think just a bit of a broader question is the industries that we tend to talk about here tend to either focus on their capability or what they need to deliver to the world uh, and then they focus on cost and then they're sort of driven elsewhere by policy. Mm -hmm. Do you, what's your opinion on how far and fast policy is going at the moment to actually influence not just the maritime and shipping industry but the rest of industry that contributes towards this? Well again I, the first thing is let's separate the, the climate problem into three pieces. The, the greenhouse gas part because I think there is a lot of action in that area, for good reason. We're trying to grapple with hotter temperatures and fires and, and those effects, and that's a struggle because it's hard to predict where and when in magnitude. I think the discussions about sea level are low, for the reasons you, you now get. Okay, they leave out the big elephant, right? And so there's been relatively, and also our planning horizon tends to be about 20 years, even in the military in many cases, okay? at least is in the U.S., and I, I suspect it's better, I think, in Europe and Scandinavia and Asia than the U.S. The U.S. tends to be shorter-term horizon, frankly, okay? But even in the best of companies, 20 or 30 years is a, is a long-term outlook, right? And this doesn't really get bagged for about 30 years. So very few people are looking at this yet. And it's also just so scary, nobody wants to talk about it. Um, and yet, when you think it through, when you see what's happening in Antarctica, like last year, rainfall. I mean, I, a guy told me that yesterday in Geneva for the first time, actually. I didn't know that. I, I missed that data point, that they had rainfall in Antarctica. And he worked for the World Meteorological Organization. He said, John, he said, do you know that it's been raining in Antarctica? I said, come on. He said, no. He said, that's how big things are changing. And he sent me the link to that video that has waterfalls in Antarctica. We didn't have those before. Didn't have this last year either. I mean, so, so we have a catch-up period here, and the military is looking at it. But I find the Coast Guard I, again. You saw me with the eight Arctic Coast Guard commandants: the U.S., Russia, Canada, and the, and the five Scandinavian countries. They're a good audience to go to because guarding the coast. I, you know, you can even you know if you're going to guard the coast, you better know where it's going to be in the future. <laughs> um, there's some ways to get people to you know lighten up a little bit about this, but to start thinking. Wait a minute. If we're going to design a new Coast Guard base, let's let's build it higher. Um, ways to make to make investments have a longer duration, but we've got to get our heads around that. It's not what we were trained to do, right? And that's why I'm excited to be here with IMRS, and I mean this Beth, for for inviting me and David. Um, you, we have uh, you, but I'm one of you too. So um, even though I'm not here often, um, you have more than fifteen thousand members in the world, and if we can educate those members who have different degrees of marine, maritime, you know, connection. Um, that's a big outreach. I mean, I'm already working on the Coast Guards and I'm working on actually the US Air Force and uh, the Danish military and made me their subject matter expert on this. But the truth is I look for leverage because this is a radical thinking. And every one of you, whether you buy my book and I've got a few copies here, but if you, and it's an ebook online if you prefer that or an audio book too, or just go to my website and take down the free stuff. I don't care, I really don't, okay? Do whatever you wish, but but tell the story. Use that chart with the 400,000 years of the green line, the red line, and the blue line. That one picture is a, is a whole course in climate change. 
use it freely. You know, it's, it's uh, we, we need to change everybody's paradigm. Our own to start with. Because we tend to talk about sea level. Now, oh, and what about the energy part? Or what about the, you know, temperatures? Well, what about the sea level and the ports and the coastlines? Uh, I'm Eva from the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council. Uh, I think from that the human, the, the, human uh, Ecology Council. Okay. Uh, so I work within the Commonwealth, and uh, about a third of the Commonwealth countries are small island states, uh, and some of them are already hit by it. So, so there you have the examples, yes. like Kiribati. Uh, I think we talked about Maldives. Yes. Maldives at least have a garbage pitch that is 15 meter high so they can move on to that one but uh, I think that those examples if those you could get these people they must be working in the shipping industry too saying I can't go back home because the high line is no longer there maybe that is uh, because it's, sometimes it's it, to try to get to people to change their minds that it, examples are very good thank you mm -hmm. the examples help we all have trouble accepting this. I mean, there's, I can't remember the place in the British, uh, down in the southeastern coast, where they've done a, an evaluation, it's rural at land, and they, they figured out they, it's not economical to defend against sea level rise and erosion. Um, I lived in the Bahamas, I said, for 25 years. I mean, I'm, it's a pretty low-lying country. Um, this is really tough stuff, whether you live in New York City, or Miami, or Mumbai, or Shanghai. I mean, this is really tough stuff, okay? The world's going to change. We knew that, but we never thought the shoreline was going to move. And at, and and one thing I, I think I forgot to say is, one of the other conceptual things that we have to get our heads around is that sea level is this slow, incremental thing, and then the wave comes and the storm and the king tide. They're the big event or the tsunami, you know, that we worry about. We plan for them. We're planning for the big event. Sea level can't rise that quickly. Nobody's going to die from sea level rise. You can move. You can crawl out from the pace that sea level crust. Think of it. I mean, really. We need to laugh a little bit, too, because it's like going to the doctor and hearing you've got an illness. I really believe this. You, a little honey makes the medicine go down, you know, and, and if we're trying to get people to think about this, it's just like if I went to the doctor and my doctor gave me a terrible prognosis, I'd go home and cry and get drunk or whatever, but then I'd say, well, what are my options, you know? We all do that. We've all been through that life. And we have to kind of do that here because we've really got to figure out how to plan for the future. And some of those island states are going to disappear. Yeah. Uh, they are, they are some of them all disappear. Yeah. And I, I think I understand. Talk, talk, talking about that, that they, they have to replace. Where are they moving? The youngs are moving to Australia. And, and, uh, I understand. But the, the old one, they don't want to move. So they I understand. Put, um, we, so we, our culture, mm -hmm. you know, this, this young lady sneezed early, you know, and I said, God bless you. You know why we say God bless you? Because 1,500 years ago, the Pope said, bless somebody when they sneeze because it's the first sign of the plague. 1,500 years from now, we're, later, we're still blessing people. We don't do it for coughs. Okay, We just do it for sneezes because the Pope said to, Pope Gregory I, I think it was, okay? We have a very slow adjustment time in culture. Okay? <laughs> We tend to believe sea level is going to be sea level. This is our, probably our hardest lesson to adapt to. And it's an opportunity. It's the glass half empty or half full. And we have to see it as an opportunity. I really believe that. There's tremendous opportunity to educate, to plan, and to actually adapt. This is Prakash, uh, into refining petrochemical and industry. In, in the context of uh, education probably to a stage where we would want to adapt. Uh, are there any good examples in recent times that's been set in terms of planning for the future? Any industries, organizations, communities like the Dutch did as you mentioned? Well I think the Dutch did for coastal flooding, the same storm that hit London back in 53 February 1st, but I think uh, the whole renewable energy industry is doing pretty well. I mean, there's been tremendous advance in the last decade with solar energy and wind power, right? You, you own electric cars and so on. Those are all great examples. Medicine has certainly done advances, computers, our cell phones and things like that. But those were all positive, fun advancements, if you will. Giving up the towns where we were born or our parents or grandparents are buried, that's not a fun thing to contemplate. In fact, it's really tough. 
But again, I, 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 scientists never use metaphors because they're never perfect. But I've learned that metaphors are one of the best ways to, to share concepts. You know, and um, it is a little bit like getting older. We're going to die. We don't want to plan on that, right? But we, but we actually do. And we certainly like to put it off as long as possible. And we enjoy life while it's here. And then there's rebirth and so on and, and new generations. And the world's going to change. And it just, it helps me at least. I've got a 16-year-old daughter. And as I was writing my book and trying to figure out how to explain this, I mean, I had to grapple with that. And I'm sure some of you do too. And uh, it's what gets, gets me through it that, you know, I hope she and her generation adapt. I hope that we get smarter and begin doing the right thing. But every generation goes through its own challenge. Okay? This is a different one. Okay. I mean, so Britain knows that better than anybody. I mean, from going back to the war and so on and various changes. I mean, maybe it's maybe this is our learning opportunity, you know, to do things different. And sometimes we need a real kick to change our way of thinking. And sea level changing as opposed to the climate effects, as opposed to changing the energy equation and the greenhouse gases. I hope you see that um, just separating climate into those three things is helpful. Um, okay, good question. First of all, to repeat the question, with the U.S. threatening to withdraw from Paris, what is the impact, I think, and is there, since the U.S. is a major factor in the world and contributor to the problem, I, I think it's what's the outlook? Is that an effect? Leadership. Yeah, leadership. You know, it's a problem. The, the, the good news is that um, even though most Americans do not support President Trump on this issue, about 70% of the people do think climate change is a problem, we should do something. He's in a minority. Uh, you know about minority governments. You've had your own issues here, I think, and, and certainly other controversial issues. Um, if the U.S. stays out of the Paris Climate Accord, it could decrease the improvement by 30%. So it's significant, but not the end of the world. But 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 there's a four, it's just like Brexit. There's a, there's a several year process to get out of the Paris Agreement. Okay, so he may be out of office by the time that we fall out. But the good news is the concern about this, which is pretty widespread in industry and, and the public and mayors and states, they're all working harder than ever. And in a, in a funny psychological way, it may be the best thing possible because if you disagree with this leader and the governor of California and the mayor of New York and the, you know, the, the mayor of Miami and so on, and they'll say, we're, we're going to do it without Trump, you know? And so we'll work our way through this. The fact is the time frames here are slow enough that the four years, I don't want to say it's not important, but you know, we'll get through that blip. And he doesn't dictate the policy. We're getting off of coal anyway. I mean, his saying we need to pander to the coal industry is the experts in the coal industry know this is not, not going to happen. Coal is a dying power source. It's not going to end tomorrow, but 50 years from now, nobody believes we're going to be building new coal plants. Okay, China has just stopped 103 that were under construction. So we are going to change, but this is a profound change. This is like changing our diet to be healthier. Back, you know, which happened to most of our generation, whether it be organic food or you know watching cholesterol or things like that that our grandparents didn't do. You know, perhaps. Okay, this is a seismic change. This is a fundamental change of our attitude toward the planet. But the first step is to conceptualize it and not to put this in the same bucket as the carbon and the other effects and all the other animal and protect the wildlife and recycling. The thing which worry, disturbs me the most is when people say, I get it, John, I'm really concerned about climate. I'm going to go home and do more recycling. And I say, go home and do more recycling, but it won't have any effect on climate change. None. Because a lot of recycling, like taking paper and sorting it and moving it and transporting it back to recycling, actually uses more energy. And energy is the cause of this problem. It's the greenhouse gases. So I recycle every day. But don't let anybody think that recycling is going to stop climate change. One more, and then we'll break for lunch, I think.
Jeff Jackson, I'm a structural engineer. I've um, been involved in the oil and gas industry production for the last few years. Um, I've been to also a member of Society on Water Technology. We had a talk there recently, which was talking about because obviously the oil price is very depressed at the moment, trying to cheer us up. And they said, I can't remember the exactly, I might get this slightly wrong, but by the year 2050, we'll still be using 50% of our energy source will come from fossil fuels. So that's certainly not going to, if that's correct, that's certainly, we're going to look at the higher end. Because we're well, not, let's bet a beer on it. In 2050, we'll, we'll, we'll meet up and see who wins, right? <laughs> this is what I've been told. Please apply energy, Alan. Let's see what you can talk on this. I, try and share yourself. You know, um, we don't know. I mean, I think the innovations in renewable energy have been spectacular. And um, nobody knows what the future is going to be like at that level, okay? I mean, the industry doesn't want to see its own demise. So I understand that people in petrochemicals think we're going to use petrochemicals for a long time. The coal industry would like to think that too, but the handwriting's on the wall there. So I, I, I can't prove the answer, but regardless, I think you'd see that even the petrochemical industry, if they're going to build a new refinery on near, near a coastal area, probably wants to design it to allow for two or three meters of sea level rise. It's cheaper. It's cheaper to invest in the field. I guess that's another point I missed, is instead of raising the roads or the refineries or the power plant 30 centimeters at a time, it's cheaper to raise it one meter at once. That's obvious, right? And if you know that a certain place isn't going to be there for 100 years, maybe you don't invest quite as much in infrastructure. Thank you. You've been a certainly an attentive audience, and I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you very much indeed, John. I think it's been a hugely thought-provoking um, and very, uh, uh, very, very interesting speech. I think your message has been really clear. What about advocacy and getting the message out there? And thank you very much for the links and the information. So I think you know our uh, our task is is pretty clear. So would you mind uh, joining me once again to thank John for what was an excellent. Research?